building offensive security skills. And it's coming from CISO from Halifax Regional Police. Please welcome Andrew Kozma. Hey everybody, can you, can you hear me? Awesome, thank you. It's nice to see some familiar faces and some new ones too. Um, we're talking about building offensive security skills. Uh, this is something uh, for those, how many here in the room actually caught Reggie's talk this morning? Reggie McLean. I did. <laughs> I know you did. Uh, Reg, Reg touched uh, on a few of the topics that we're going we're to discuss in depth today. Um, I do have a full slide deck. It's only about 25 slides, but it's, I'm going to talk about the headline and for the, the type of presentations that I do. I haven't done a presentation like this for a little while, so we're tempting the demo guys. Um, we're going to actually exploit a, a workstation or a, a, a target today um, and uh, talk about the importance of offensive security skills uh, and how being a well-rounded information security professional and what's required today and what's expected today. So um, this is me, this is you, uh, building offensive security skills, improving your defensive security posture with offensive security strategies. Uh, Alex talked a little bit about me. Uh, InfoSec professional working in the public sector. And I always refer to myself as an information security professional. Um, I'm an active board member for the Atlantic Security Conference. How many here have attended Atlantic Security Conference in the past? Wow. You all come in next year, right? Uh, honestly, uh, April 24th and 25th for 2019. Anybody know the Klein bottle guy on the internet? Clifford Stoll? Anybody heard of Clifford Stoll? Clifford Stoll is the opening keynote for Atlantic Security Conference. Uh, if you've ever seen Back to the Future movie, uh, great God! Clifford Stoll is the blueprint for Doc. Uh, anyway, I'm a dad and a midnight act hacker. What does that mean? Well, at any given time in my house, there's a four year old. A 14-year-old and an 18-year-old. So, um, late nights with the 18-year-old, early mornings with the four-year-old, and sometimes in between, I get to practice hacking and building up my skills. Uh, that's why I say I'm a perpetual student. I love to learn. Uh, Reg talked about it earlier this morning. Uh, in order to be proficient in what we do, um, you kind of gotta take it on the chin and recognize you don't know everything. And one of the biggest things that I've seen from the most elite people in our industry that have crazy zero day finding crypto math skills and the big brains, there's, um, there's a lot of animosity and there's a lot of not supporting each other in our communities. And I wanna stress the importance of supporting each other and the importance of education. Literally everybody in this room knows something I don't. And if you can humble yourself and approach learning that way, you'll make a lot more friends. And I'm a big fan of Bruce Lee, ninjas, and samurai films. Anybody know who these guys are? Come on. That's right, Yo Jimbo. Anybody see the movie Hard Boiled with Bruce Willis when he hangs out in the town in two gangs and he plays them against each other? That movie was recorded uh, 1954. It's Yo Jimbo. And the other fellow that's with him is uh, Shintaro Katsu. He plays a character called Zatoichi, and uh, he's the blind swordsman. So there's a theme throughout my presentations, and as we talk about offensive security practices and information security practices, um, there's a number of there's a number of comparisons. Rich talked about the tactical arms race this morning, or Rich talked about tactical arms race this morning. I'm a lifelong martial artist, studied a bunch of different stuff, and the principles apply. And uh, I'm going to move into the next slide. Anybody know who Miyamoto Musashi is? Right on. Absolutely. The swordsman. The last samurai. This guy was famous for the school of two swords. See, he's willing two swords in his hands. As an information security professional, when I say professional, in one hand is your technical acumen and your technical skill set. In your other hand is business acumen. Both of them together can make you a deadly force. Or you can talk defensive and offensive skills. But Miyamoto Musashi was the founder of the Two Sword School. And at that time, 
when the feudal era of Japan, they would have two hands on a sword. They had one long sword called a katana and one short sword called a wakizashi. This guy basically kicked everybody's butt with two full katanas. So when uh, we do references and we talk about principles in offensive security and what is hacking and what is, is to be defensive in nature and protecting your organizations and your infrastructure, in one hand you have your technical skill set. In the other hand, you have your business acumen because you have to be able to talk to C-level folks. You have to be able to interact and present risk and make it mean something. You have to drive value. So <clears throat> one of my favorite quotes from Musashi, and he also wrote the book of five rings, is do nothing which is of no use. And uh, this is what I say. Do nothing which is of no use for your organization and or for others slash community. That's why I drove from Halifax to come talk at B-Side. This is why I'm involved at the Atlantic Security Conference. Not only am I an active board member for the Atlantic Security Conference, I'm a co-founder. And I support monthly meetings in Halifax called the Halifax Area Security Clash, where we talk about stuff like this. So what are we going to talk about today? What are we going to do today? You're catching a theme. Uh, Fight Club, Chuck Lania, one of the greatest adaptations, film adaptations of the novel. I read the novel when it first came out, and I love the movie. Uh, how much can you know about yourself if you've never been in a fight? How much can you know about your organization if you've never had to respond to an incident? Right? Most organizations today uh, are getting breached. The dwell time is over 200 days. And what I mean by dwell time is from penetration to detection, 200 days. So picture me with my suit and tie for 200 days coming to your office, sitting down and working. What do you think I can learn 200 days by your organization? So we could do better. We have to do better. So this is about hacking our own infrastructure to improve Defensive security measures and processes. So knowing how things get exploited, know how things get compromised, uh, and then building out a response plan so that you can respond in an adequate fashion to protect your organization. And I'll be the first guy to tell you, if you spend more than one dollar than what an asset's value is worth, your security program and your security practices isn't very good. Uh, and that's what we're all about. It's all about supporting the business. The business isn't there to hire security professionals. The security professionals are hired to support the business, full stop, period. Once, once we understand that and we change our position, the business is our client, right? Their infrastructure, we may have lots of opportunity for work, lots of requirement, lots of need for our services. Truth of the matter is, we are there to support the business. The business isn't there to run a security team. So today, we're going to do a demo. Scan all the things, own all the things. So I kind of broke out some of the stuff into two easy um, activities. And the tools we're going to use, Kali Linux. Everybody knows what Kali is, right? Kali Linux is a distribution maintained and uh, operated, or maintained by the crew at Offensive Security. Offensive Security. Uh, are a professional services company. They have a designation called the OSCP, Offensive Security Certified Professionals. Uh, I will be the first to tell you my path down this, my first step down this path. I was a Windows System Administrator. Oh, ten years, seven, eight, a number of years ago, and um, I wanted to learn offensive security, so I went, found them online. I'll sign up for that way we went. Never in my life have I booted anything up from Linux. Not once. So I stepped into that world and then it kicked my butt. But at the end of it, <coughs> after a failed certification attempt, because I knew I wasn't going to pass, um, I knew now how much I didn't know. And it started a continuous learning. Uh, path for me that's, that's led to what I consider a professional, which is the ability to demonstrate both defensive skills and offensive security skills. When you're in a boardroom or when you're talking to your manager, it's one thing to say, oh, this guy's falling, there's risk over here, we have to do something. 
Now, spend, spend, spend. And the vendors upstairs would love you to spend like that. Truth of the matter is, you can only do that once or twice. And then your impact to the organization is kind of, oh, who keeps inviting the security guy to the meetings? We'll never get that project done. But the culture has to change to include us. So we're going to use uh, Kali Linux, and we're going to target legacy infrastructure, right? So there are a couple of things. I'm a principle-based security professional, and I'm a principle-based martial arts. Bruce Lee had principles. You put your strong side first, right? He never put his strong side back. I always put his strong side first. Um, leveraging those types of principles and bring security down to principles, and if you understand the principle, you can apply that that knowledge. Um, so, the difference between a good security administrator and analyst and a great security administrator and analyst, good security analyst and administrator, they know the policies and the procedures, but the great security analyst knows every single exception to one of those policies and procedures. So they know about the Oh, Linux server in the back that we can't upgrade the kernel on because the vendor says we won't support you if you do, right? But you got to keep it on, got to keep the lights on, got to keep the business going. That's our jobs. So everybody has legacy infrastructure to some degree, and that's what we're going to target today. So some objectives. The first rule of Fight Club is you don't talk about Fight Club. Sorry, Chuck, we have to talk about this. This is what it is, knowledge sharing, right? There's a big difference between information and intelligence. I caught a couple minutes of the intelligence talk upstairs. <clears throat> intelligence is the application of information, full stop. So <coughs> what you learned today, I hopefully you learned something. You're able to take it away, start your own path, start messing around with tools, maybe um, reverse engineering some binaries and some firmware upgrades, or even reverse engineer a Windows patch to see what is it they're trying to do. So you recognize and you find a proof of concept for an exploit online, learn about it, and you look at the patch and you reverse engineer it and build out your skill set. That's really what we're talking about today. I need a sip of water. I got cotton mouth real bad. So, with proper planning and authorization, authorization is a big one. Don't scan your work stuff without work knowing it. Especially if there are any change managers in the room. I'm not speaking from personal experience, but they don't like it when you break stuff at 2 a.m. in the morning because you had a VA scan and you wanted to see what was going on. Um, so, the goal, controlled environment where it's safe to practice offensive security techniques. Usually with this slide, I have a picture of a monkey with a gun. Truth be told, you can go and download Kali Linux and create havoc with very little knowledge. Um, but it's all about muzzle control, where you point it, how you, how you execute um, your activities. Early in my career, after I failed the OSCP the first time, I was like, I can't afford to keep subscribing to their lab. I'm going to be broken. And how many times can I ask the... How many times have I asked my manager to approve it? So I found free resources. Vuln Hub, if you haven't been there, go check it out. There are distributions for capture the flag. There are <coughs> distributions that are specifically designed to be weak for you to test and build your skills. And some of them have great walkthroughs. And in the beginning, to be honest with you, I needed the walkthroughs. I would bring up the machine, and if I could find its IP address, I didn't know where to go after that. So the walkthroughs were kind of like, okay, and a little hints if I need it. And that's important. So with proper planning and authorization, along with an understanding of the risks, you can and will test protection on infrastructure. Virtualization is a beautiful thing. If you asked me that last night, I might have, <laughs> I might have had a few choice words. Um, if you look at some of the scans, so my, my presentation is built out like a tutorial, but we're actually going to do the demo. Remember I mentioned the demo. But my presentation is built out like a tutorial, so they're actually step-by-step -step instructions, so you guys can start doing this stuff yourself as well. Last night, I had problems with VMDK and ended up just scrapping it and rebuilding and starting a new. So, practice. Amateurs practice till they get it right. Remember? 
said we're information security professionals. Professionals practice till they cannot get it wrong. So <laughs> hopefully, if the demo gods are on my side, I practice enough that I sound like a little bit like I know what I'm talking about. So, scanner. Any, anybody familiar with Nmap? Hi, uh, awesome. Um, Gordon, Theodore. He, he wrote Nmap, what, 15 years ago? Might be 18 now. That thing is an amazing, amazing utility. And I recognize that you're not going to be able to see this. We're going to do it through the actual uh, demonstration. So what we're going to do is launch an Nmap scan against our target. And um, what we're doing is detect the operating system. We're going to detect the services and their versions. We're going to run some of the Nmap scripting engine scripts against the target. And we're going to output everything in an XML format. Then we're going to leverage the Nmap XSL style sheet. Anybody ever use Nmap style sheets? Oh, you want you to do the first time. And if you have more than one host and you start scanning networks, you're going to love it. And then you'll see in our command, dash dash open, dash dash reason. So that tells the scanner, I only want information about open ports, and I only want, I want to know the reason why they're open, and I want to know the service that's running on them. So the whole command, this big long thing, and after a while you'll get used to it, it just becomes second nature. What you'll find is, which one am I supposed to capitalize, and which one am I not? And then what we do is we convert the Nmap scan to uh, HTML, so they can be browsed in Firefox. So the output by default is in XML, because that's what we asked for. But then there's this XSL, XSLT proc solution. You convert it to uh, HTML, and you'll get something that looks like this. Gives you your sans scan summary, gives you a nice table, and uh, presents the data much better than what you could consume in your terminal. Uh, and the scan all the things part, scan all the things, pwn all the things, the scan all the things part, the more information you can gather, the more success, the more likelihood you'll have success with regards to any type of exploits or any type of activity that you want to pursue. So scan and gather as much information about your target as you can. Anybody familiar with Go Secure upstairs? Did you swing by and talk to them about advanced adversary protection? Here's the difference from what we're doing and what an advanced adversary would do. An advanced adversary, they won't scan anything in your environment. Because they'll get caught. They'll get picked up. They'll get identified. You can block your source IP address and do something else. Those guys are slow and roll. Remember the 222 day dwell time? These are the kind of guys that are sitting in your network. They don't need to scan because they've been there a long time and they're gathering that information passively not necessarily active and you may not know about it. So, <coughs> uh, let's actually, before we dive into that, I'm glad I got the mic because I'm going to sit down and why don't we launch the commands to do our end map. Sorry folks, let me switch back and forth. We're not going to do that every time, I hope, right? Okay. So, slow and low. Uh, also, I didn't spend a cent other than my laptop to perform any of these activities. Uh, Kali Linux is a free distribution. I'm running the VMware player, and you can see non-commercial use only, and I selected that option. So I don't have some of the advanced features of the VMware player, but for what we're going to do today, this is more than enough. So, I'm using the VMware player to host our attacker and our defender. I'm logging into our attacker now. And our defender is the other one, this one, right here, this guy. I just want to make sure nothing's changed since I practice. So the target IP address is 192.168.116.130. That's what we're going to scan. And our source is the Kali Linux box. But it's really clunky and difficult to continue to use the virtual manager interface. So 
Remember I said about making exceptions? <laughs> I made an exception and allowed root to SSH to um, the Kali box, right? But I know about that exception, so it's kind of okay, right? For, for the purpose of the demonstration, purpose, honestly, you would never enable root uh, SSH access. And if there's a Unix admin in the audience, wave the crow's foot and have a drink of vodka for me because we're about to go into demo land. What's up, Phil? I could add a. Yeah, I could have. That's best practice. That's that's best practice. And remain OS for like two years, so just Everybody can see that. That's as big as I could make the font. Um, and I have a crib sheet that that I'm going to use because I really don't want to not really don't want to screw up for any. <coughs> Oh, absolutely. Come on up. So, remember we talked about Nmap. Nmap is the de facto default scanner. Uh, the first TAC O is identify the operating system of the target. Uh, the second one is identify the services, dash SV. The third one runs some of the scripting features. The third one is output uh, with big X, means put output as XML. So it's going to create a file in uh, root slash b size slash nmap dash scan dot xml. We're going to use the style sheet nmap xml xsl, and then I want to know the open ports and the reason why they're open, and then the target IP address. So that scan is already run, and if we sit here and wait for scans to run, it's going to be a lot longer than the time that I have allotted. But we can go into root. B size. And you can see that we have our nmap scan XML file that was output. Oh, 10.30 last night. So uh, that is the XML version of the files that we looked at that generate this. And let's take a second and talk about this. So. This is much easier to look at than the, con the information that gets jammed into a terminal. This is the actual style sheet that MMAP has come with it. Uh, if you're an HTML guy or a web guy or a gal, uh, you can easily customize this, throw your logo up, whatever you need to do. But what's important is it gathers the information and you'll see that, remember we asked, I want to know what ports are open, what services are associated with them, and a reason why. Uh, so it's compiled all this information for us, uh, and it's even done the remote operating systems detection, uh, and you can see right here the MMAP scan uh, and the time that it was ran. Um, so <coughs> MMAP is the de facto. Now, if you want to, and then we only scanned a single host in this one, but if you want to scan a Class C network or a 24-bit mass network, uh, it organizes this first table here. You'll have multiple IP addresses appear in this table. Each one is clickable. So you click to it, and then you'll see the services and the ports that are associated with it. When you start to build that information, even understanding what is on your network uh, is important. And I'm going to talk about one of the first principles, uh, being a principle-based information security. One of the first things you'll hear me say to juniors or anybody that I work with is, if you cannot detect it, you cannot protect it. The NIST cybersecurity framework has five individual um, columns that run across the top. Identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. In the beginning, on the identify and protect side, and even detect, they're having technology. So that's where your spend is. There's a lot of technology that do some of that. The respond and recover, that's us. So they talk about the autom automation and the introduction of robots. Even their most advanced security practitioners upstairs, even if their companies are, say they're using AI, which I highly desire, um, realistically, it's going to always come down to us. We're always going to be a part of the equation. So it'll be us and automated intelligence working together, some form of automation. Um, and as attacks continue to increase in sophistication and automation, our defenses are going to have to as well. And automation can make one defender appear like an army. So you can use it as a force multiplier. So 
That's the NMAP stuff. Jumping back into our presentation. <coughs> And the reason why I specifically talked about not spending any money, I use the community edition of VMware Player. I'm running it on my work laptop, which is municipally provided and let's, if my laptop and your laptop got in the octagon, I don't think my laptop will win. <laughs> let's just leave it at that. So I'm able to create a little small environment on this laptop to help me learn some of these skills is what I'm talking about. So OpenVAS, anybody heard of OpenVAS? Awesome. OpenVAS is the Open Vulnerability Assessment Scanner. Anybody heard of Nessus from Tenable? I know they're upstairs. Okay, cool. Tenable is the closed fork version of OpenVAS, right? So if Tenable can do it, in the edition 10 as well. So it's easy to install. It doesn't come installed natively on Kali. Some distros they do. Um, but you can install OpenVAST in Kali. It's as simple as apt get install OpenVAST. So Kali doesn't have it installed by default, but it does have their appropriate source lists so that you can install it just using apt. So once we have it downloaded and installed, we can run the OpenVAST setup. And it'll run a configuration installation script that makes it easy. Once it's installed, there are a couple of commands of note. Uh, open bass add user. Pretty simple. That's how you add an administrative user. <coughs> or a user with access. Uh, open bass feed update. So the difference between Tenable and Open Bass right now, uh, besides the open fork and the closed fork for Tenable. Um, the web interface is different, obviously, when, when Tenable closed their fork, forked it off and closed it, they, they built a really pretty web front end and matured the product uh, quite a bit. But OpenVAS is still heavily supported by a community around version 9 right now, and uh, they are also providing feed updates. And what feed updates are is all of the vulnerabilities associated with the services. So remember in our NMAP scan, that I want to know what service is running on it. So in the vulnerability assessment scanner, if I'm running a legacy version of, oh, let's say Samba or SMB or whatever <coughs> application, OpenVAST database is a collection of these vulnerabilities, or CVEs, common vulnerabilities and experts. And then the last one, OpenVAST check setup. So once you've done all this, OpenVAST has a script that can tell you, yeah, everything's installed and it's working. Looks good. You're presented with the Green Bone Security Desktop. Pretty cool, menacing looking doggy dinosaur. I don't know. And Green Bone, terrible name, but um, for free, it fits my budget. Didn't spend anything. And let's talk about what you get. So here's the best part. There are some, I love to see some of the young people, and there are some vets that have been around that have worked in the information security for a number of years. I had this conversation with Sylvain Dumont at the, uh, the cafe table. See this number here? This is 1999 on the graph. And these are the number of exploits in infrastructure. So you can see it's not going the other way, right? Since 1999, it's increased. And the conversation I had with Sylvain was, you know, if you meet somebody and they say, oh, I've got 25 years of information security experience, I'm here to tell you right now, Tell them you're full of it. Bullocks. Challenge you. Bullocks. At best, 2,000. See? Right here. But for the young people that are in school today, this is an exciting time. Because well, I got thrown into information security because I was a network security architect. And the firewall attached to the network. And we got hit with SQL Slammer, the Alyssa virus, so the I love you virus. For those that don't know. Um, so I ended up through attrition, doing more and more security activity, more and more security work. Today, you can graduate and get an information security job right out the gates. And we need you. We need you. There's a young man I met today. Paul, in the back. Paul, correct? Yeah. He's, he's come through the Cyber Titan programs. Uh, there's going to be white papers about you for years. 
hopefully we can use people like Paul to address the cybersecurity skills gap that we hear so much about. So for free, we get a dashboard that identifies oh, 130,000 plus vulnerabilities in various products. Didn't spend a cent. Also, when I create a scan, which is all GUI based driven, didn't want to break it down for a tutorial on this, it's pretty, <coughs> pretty intuitive. Uh, it's click and go. Uh, you can see that this is the scanner and this is the target. Red is bad, right? And now, that, now, that I, now that I'm at the sea level, which I have a bit of struggle, I'll be honest with you, a little bit of the, the mindset change, more managerial than technical these days. But, uh, boy, I sure do miss it. So, this is just a quick overview of the target system and the vulnerabilities that were identified when we scanned it. So, we used Nmap to identify open ports and the services running on them. And we used OpenVAS to look at the versions of services, compare it to a known database of exploits, and then report on what can be exploited, right? This is all coming together. Remember, scan all the things, and then pwn all the things. So we're getting to the other half. So OpenVAS creates a pretty kick-ass report. Let's just switch back and take a look at one. And for zero dollars, meets my budget. And uh, it's one of those things that can be introduced pretty quickly. Sorry, you guys can't hear that clicking around in my mouth. It drives my night white nuts when I have like a cough drop or anything. But I'm getting the cough nut pretty bad. Okay. Here's the uh, HTML version of the Nmap output. We scanned a single host. If we scanned a network, they'd all be presented uh, chronologically. And same kind of deal. <coughs> Show me the ports and the threat level associated with some of these services. This host, pretty bad, but it's bad by design so that we can practice, right, and learn what not to do. So security issues for, and when you see high, and this CVSS, this is an industry standard. It means common vulnerability scoring system. Uh, when you see anything red, which is pretty much seven and a half or seven to 10, means that it can be exploited easily and remotely. So when we talk about infrastructure that's connected to the internet, if it has a CVSS score of 10, that's really bad because everybody else on the internet could, in theory, own your stuff remotely. You would never, you'd never know. And of course, we scan legacy architecture. Look at the first thing. Oh, that's end of life detection. So you're running an oper operating system on a remote host that reaches end of life and should not be used anymore. Why? Why is that significant? Well, because there could be exploits that are identified after the fact that will never be patched and or supported. All you have to do is think about Windows XP in your environment and you'll know what we're talking about. So that's what it looks like. Um, lots of information. <coughs> So, oh, the other half. So we scanned and we created two XML files. We created an Nmap scan XML and we created an OpenVAS scan XML. Anybody familiar with Metasploit? Anybody heard of Metasploit? Awesome, cool. Metasploit is an exploit handler, it's a handler. And what it does is allow you to deliver exploits. Uh, have remote connections that come back uh, called shells. Some of them have different levels of access. You can get interactive shells, etc., etc. Um, but Metasploit is the de facto exploit handler, and it makes the work easy. Um, first developed by a guy named H. D. Moore, who worked at Rapid Seven, and now he's doing his own thing. Um, prior to the Metasploit framework. You would have to compile your payload, compile your export, compile it all manually, and it was a very tedious process. Metasploit provided a framework that 
could pack everything, deliver the exploit, the whole shebang, Swiss Army knife for security testing. So, we're going to open up the Metasploit framework and just jump right back into here. Everybody can see that? Oh no, it didn't switch. I got to get out of the presentation. Oh, dang. There it goes. We're going to switch back and forth a little bit. The demo got up in there. Okay, root at Cali B sides. So we're going to go MSF console. And it's thousands and thousands of lines of code to build out this handler. So uh, sometimes it takes a little while. But once we have it, we're going to use the output of our scans to populate the database of Metasploit. <coughs> so let's go back in here real quick. So if the, the command is actually db underscore import and then root, besides is our working directory, and then we have nmap scan dash xml, I'll import that, which is already being done, and then the other one is open vas scan. Uh, XML, which are both there. And I can check because we can ask the database, what hosts do you have? Here's our target system. It knows that it's 192, 168, 116, 130. Here's its MAC address. Operating system is Linux. It's an old kernel, 26, and it's a server. Now, remember we asked for nmap scan to provide us the services. Let's see if the services were successfully employed and implemented, in, or if the services were successfully imported into the Metasploit database. Yeah. So it's shown the host, and it's shown a bunch of open ports and a bunch of services. So our nmap scan results are being imported beautifully. And the last one. The, the open mask scan, we want to know what vulnerabilities are available. And as you see, a lot. And that's by design. And that's why something like Vulnerable Hub <coughs> is great. Uh, <coughs> you can get Capture the Type Flag exercise. Anybody participate in the Capture the Flag tonight? Awesome. I would encourage you all to try. Uh, it's not anything that, don't, don't be technically scared, frightened of it. Um, there are a lot of people, Lily is a great resource, ask her for help, she'll give you hints. Yeah. I maybe, maybe give you hints for a drink. Uh, I'll, I'll give hints, but I think the right answer is also hints in the CCAP where you can put on hints on the things like that. So I would uh, I recommend everybody start, and as a matter of fact, there's a lot of capture the flag stuff, so you can take some of the scaredyness out of it in front of your peers by practicing at home and alone. So just like we did here. So I have a target machine up, and I can remember the very first time. Like, okay, now what? And I sat there and looked at it for a while. And then I found a walkthrough, and I started to reverse engineer that. And then small steps get you to the point where you start looking at proof of concepts for exploits on the internet that are available. And then you look at the patch, and you get a specific set of skills where you can start reverse engineering patches and start seeing oh, hey, Microsoft, this is how they approach some of those things. <coughs> and you'll often find times, even with patching and the change advisor board and the other things, but anytime you change a system, even with security patches, there's very high potential that you could introduce other additional risks. So having that kind of knowledge, building out your offensive security skill set to include, hey, this is how they code, this is how they build an exploit, and then this is furthermore how they build a patch to address some of those exploits. That's what we're talking about today. That's why, uh, who is it? Dave Kennedy. Dave Kennedy gets a lot of heat for the social engineer's tool set. Makes it too easy. Truth of the matter is, easy for me as a professional is good. Because I don't have 
the time to become a malware author and become an expert at malware. But I can learn very quickly how to use a tool that can do a lot of the complex tasks of man handling malware and test it against my environment and then build out an incident response plan <coughs> so that when stuff does go south, I can respond quicker. So really, offensive security skills are about you kicking the crap out of your own environment so that you can start to address some of the things, what worked, what didn't work. And you can start identifying those exceptions, right? That's a legacy system that can never be upgraded because the vendor won't support it if we upgrade the curve, yada, yada. So, go to my crib sheet. We've imported, we checked our import, so this is where we are. Um, Bones have been identified as weaknesses. Pause. I missed a whole section of my notes, but I know that I put them in my presentation. Absolutely. Um, this, I'm tempted to demo gods, and quite honestly, since June, my capacity is being very much managerial. Um, so bear with me. Oh my gosh, we're gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna have to get moving here. Uh, we've identified imports, export. Okay, so we're gonna exploit Samba. So we're gonna use this command here. Oh, back up. On exploitation, we did our checking the import, check, check, check. We actually didn't put in the exploitation part. And I should say use in front of that. So we'll go back to our we'll go back to our MSF console. We'll say use exploit, because we're gonna. And then I want to know the info about this. So uh, Metasploit Framework is modular, and you can, it uses modules uh, <coughs> for various functions. And this, this particular exploit is even telling me what CVE it is. You can see it's old, 2007. Um, but, oh, there's no R host set, so we need to set R host. Let's say 168.1.1. Is it 130 or 230? I don't know. 130. Wrong. Now if I do info, see that the R host value is set right here. Should have set the port force as well. So let's go back and double check. We can try to exploit it. Let's see if it works. So simple. We set our, our host, set our, our port, we've got our target destination. Let's try and exploit it. Come on, work. All right. So, who am I? Root. What's my working directory? Root. Just to make sure I'm on the right machine. One sixteen, one thirty. So now I have a shell from my attacker to the other machine. So every command I issue through this handler right now is executed on the remote machine. So I ask the remote machine, yes. So basically, the script is there as a module. So during the DB import phase, I imported the vulnerabilities that were identified, and I picked Samba, or I, I picked Samba because how many people in here are Windows admin in their environment? Ever set up a Unix server with SMB shared? You know how many Windows administrators set it up, 
and can't get Sharon right so that they misconfigure it. So I picked this particular exploit because realistically it's what happens in the real world. It's a misconfiguration. But for this particular example, it's run in a service that's exploitable through remote code. There's actually a buffer overflow, some other things that happen in the back end. But I didn't have to worry about it because Exploit does all the heavy lifting for me. So um, let's just, so for the users, for the Unix events, what do you think of that one? What's this? Right? At C password. So Unix does this cool thing with user accounts. It takes user ID and it takes the password and it creates two separate files. One is Etsy password and the other one is Etsy shadow. So in our demo today, and what I displayed here is the actual contents of both of those files because when we compromise the box through the SMB share or the Sambish exploit, I have system level access root privileges. So I can look at everything now. So what I looked at and what I'm moving towards is, now that I've got it exploited, I want persistence. I want to stay there. So what do I do to maintain persistence? Well, I dump every account that's on the box and capture their username and password so that I have more than one avenue to go back, right? And now I can use those accounts to start moving laterally. So the likelihood that a help desk might have tech support account on a Windows machine is pretty high. If I'm able to dump the tech support account on one machine using Metasploit, I could probably start moving laterally with the credentials that I've harvested, right? So basically, what we'll do next is use John, John the Ripper. And John is going to take those two files that we uh, had, Etsy password and Etsy shadow, and we're going to use a command to unshadow them. And if I do my directory here, you'll see that shadow.txt and password.txt literally I just cut and paste off the screen and save it as a text file. And then I use the I use a command that um, allows me to combine those files. So you can unshadow root b sides password.txt, root b sides shadow.txt, output it to unshadow.txt. So what that does is it takes the username and the password, combines them together into a format that John can understand. And John is going to look at the hashes, try to determine and break the hashing, and determine what the password associated with that account is. So now what we're doing is gathering uh, credentials. So, um, I will run the command for, <coughs> we've got it shadowed, we're almost there near the end. So I can do John in my SSH. Let's clear this. John, <coughs> we're going to ask John what did he, so John keeps a record of credentials that it's harvested. So I can go back and ask it. So I want, I want John root B sides, which is my working directory for the presentation, unshadow dot text. Didn't save it in the database. I don't want. I don't know if we're going to have time to run the attacks. So let's go back to what's in my presentation. <coughs> Because it worked for me last night, and of course, demo gods. So, what we did. To start cracking the password, so we have two files, cat etsy password, or etsy slash password, and etsy slash shadow. We unshadowed them, or we combined those files into a single file that John can understand. This command here, John, and then the path to that file, basically starts to look at the hashes and the username and passwords. It found six of the seven accounts, which you see, John has loaded the hashes and successfully cracked some of the passwords, which is what we're looking for. And previously cracked, cracked passwords can be viewed with command, John, show path to the file. Oh, that's why I didn't. Oh, my bad, folks. Oh, see that? Demo gods. What did I forget? I didn't ask it to show me. 
No, I, I had it unshadowed. I didn't ask it to show me. I just put John, I put John at it. I sent John at it. John would have started to try and crack. I was like, why is it asking to crack again? There we go. So that box is configured with sys, Batman, Claw, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Nobody has passwords like that, right? Uh, MSF admin, MSF admin, username, password, are the same. Postgres is configured with a default account, Postgres, Postgres, user, user, 1001. So six of the seven passwords John was able to crack because the human part, we're not very good at creating passwords. So let's go back into our presentation. On the post exploitation, and I always like to throw this in. So I didn't have time to add it, but there's an open source script called Ransack, and it just does that. As soon as you compromise a host, you can launch Ransack, and what it does is go through every attached drive on that box and look for information that is interesting and it makes a copy for you. Way easy for data exfiltration when you compromise an endpoint. So I'd say, if you have a couple minutes, take a look. It's called Ransack. Once you compromise an endpoint, it's fun to play with because you can start creating loop.txt files or payroll.xls or passwords.xls. I'd hate to say it, but I've seen it on pen tests. Even with large financial institutions that know better, somebody creates a password.xls file, and then guess what's in it? And you got it. Um, so what I wanted to talk about, and the reason why we talk about scan everything slash cone everything, uh, Way back in the beginning, when we were doing our information gathering phase, we actually were able to identify that that box had an account that was running VNC server with the password of password, right? So if we just slow down and look at all of our information, uh, way back in the beginning, it identified how easy it was to exploit, just using off-the-shelf, open-source, free tools. So what's this all about? Breaking things to make them better. And uh, you can tell I like Fight Club. Fight Club is a great movie for me. I seem to watch it at least once a year. At the time, my life just seemed too complete, and maybe we have to break everything to make something better out of ourselves. I would recommend you do that to your cybersecurity program on a regular basis. Break it. How long did it take to detect? And if it's 200 days this time, I want to be detecting it in 150 in the next time until I get to a point where whatever risk appetite my organization has, my detection capabilities, my protection capabilities, my respond and recover, we have a plan. Because the truth of the matter is, there are a lot of salespeople upstairs that will say, here's the silver bullet, we can protect that, we can protect this, we can protect that. The truth of the matter is, at some point, in some time, it's gonna fail. What you do after it fails is what's important. And that's where it requires the respond and recover, which requires people and a plan. So when you start looking at production systems, it is important to have a demonstrated, repeatable process that has buy-in from management. Maybe you change a virus report and let them know what you're up to before you start pointing Cali Linux all over your network and open that. Document your findings, indicating the threat, the likelihood of occurrence, and the impact of the business. What is that? <coughs> that is a risk register right there. When you start talking to folks at the sea level, they don't give two craps. You could talk about security for days. Their eyes will roll over in the back of their head. As soon as you say the risk to your organization, the risk to your business, when you stop talking about security and start talking about risk, that's when they start inviting you to the table. Use the information from these exercises to build business cases for investment in security. So you go back and you say, you know what, we have a monthly patch routine, but stuff is getting exploited every day. Maybe we need to look at continuous patching. What's continuous patching look like for us? There are vendors that have solutions, right? Virtualization makes patching easier somewhat, but use the information from these exercises to build a support for your program. When you start looking at the production environment, oh yeah, there'll be blood. You're gonna start finding legacy systems. You're going to start breaking stuff, and then you're going to have to go in front and say, well, you know, I thought the risk was worth it. Um, and it's a tough one, but it has to be done. And one of the very first slides I talked about, 
absorb what is useful, discard what is not, add what is uniquely your own. So, absorb what is useful for your security program, discard what is not useful for your security program, and add what is uniquely your own. As security professionals, our job is to tailor a security program to support that business. That's where the fun is. And with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for your time. Are there any questions or comments? I know we're close on time, but... <coughs> Sorry, I'm going to actually put one of these in. Absolutely. So I'll send that copy to the B-Sides crew. Um, I do run a blog. I haven't been contributing to it lately. And <coughs> one second. I do run a blog. I haven't contributed to it lately because I've just changed roles in June. So I started to work with the Halifax Regional Police in June of 2018. And they have a PR crew and uh, they don't necessarily want their chief information security officer out there teaching everybody hacking and talking to things. So everything I do now has to get vetted through public relations. So my content hasn't been updated lately, but this will be there. Uh, Infosec-samurai.com. Any other questions? Everything we did today didn't require a single cent. It was zero spent. So if you have a VMware environment, you could prop up some, I wouldn't say put it on production, isolate and segment your stuff, don't make it exposed to the internet. But even at home, if you have an opportunity to gather an old piece of equipment or something that's being decommissioned in your office, that's how I started. I was working in healthcare, and we were doing server upgrades and refresh. And I was allowed <coughs> to take the server, but not allowed to take the hard drives. And I was like, deal. So I went and bought some hard drives, uh, filled the server up and started loading a bunch of virtual images from Bone Hub and started building out my offensive security skills. And today, offensive, defensive, security, business, uh, interchangeable. So it took a while to get there. And I can remember my first path down, like I couldn't understand how there could exist a server that didn't have a GUI. Now I hate GUIs. Anyway, I know I'm not. I know there's other talks and we're at two o'clock. But if uh, if you want to chat, just tap me on the shoulder. I'd be more than uh, more than willing to, to share some of my experience and my knowledge. Thank you very much.